Hello, everybody, and welcome to Let's Get Up to Business, our podcast turn Facebook live show here during coronavirus. As you know, I'm Jordan Ostroff, the managing partner of Jordan Law FL, a business law and personal injury firm here in sunny Orlando, Florida, which, surprise her, uh, tomorrow the high will be under 80 for, I think, the <laughs> second time all year. So I'm excited for that. But I'm even more excited for our wonderful guest today. Mike Aldrich with Sandler Sales Training. So we had the opportunity, and by we, I mean uh, most of us at Jordan Law, to actually go and have Mike give us a two-hour presentation on everything they do. So I can firmly tell you, definitively tell you, Mike has some amazing information, and I'm very excited that he's willing to join us here for the uh, 24 hours to improving your business's growth and sales chit-chat. Well, Jordan, I'd like to thank you. It was, it was great meeting your team. It's always fun to work with energetic folks, and I appreciate the opportunity to spend this time with you. Wonderful. So right off the bat, if anybody's listening who knows they need sales training, which is probably everybody, because I think <laughs> that's the area that is the easiest way to make more money is closing more of the leads uh, that you're already getting, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, the best way would be just to give us a call at 407 407- three, four, two, one, two, three, five. That is my cell phone or our website is www.idealselling.sandler.com. Ideal selling. I love that. You know, <laughs> so, I'm sorry. A, a friend of mine actually coined it for me. We were just talking about when I was opening up the company, he's a, he's a best selling author. He's a great guy. He goes, yeah, you should call it something like ideal selling. I'm like, works for me? <laughs> it's, uh, well, let's do it. So it was, a, it was a fun conversation. It's always interesting to me because I think, you know, I think salespeople like lawyers get that bad rap. But when you really dive down into it and when you really are backing a product or backing a service that you truly believe in, there's so much amazingness that you can do and so much value you can provide by doing all this stuff. I mean, is that the experience that you see? Without a doubt, you know, Jordan, I, I run an exercise when I do group programs, and I, I may have done it with your group. I can't remember. But I always ask them to play a game where they know a secret word, and they have to give me hints to guess it. So if the word was apple, they would say fruit, red, core, and I, of course, would guess apple. Then I say, how about salesperson? And then it gets real quiet. Then you kind of hear sleazy, liar, pushy. So these are the the way we view the sales, even though we're not like that, you know, and the general public isn't, certainly like any profession, there's the bad actors. But because the, the, the average person views sales in that manner, salespeople lose a lot of opportunities by going out of their way not to be perceived that way. And in, and in effect, they give up their ability to manage the process, and that's where deals go sideways, they get lost opportunities, People don't get really the product they want because real conversations don't happen. And that's the thing. Like, I just, I think that so many people spend a ton of time trying to convince themselves that they're not in sales when they are, <laughs> I mean, especially for lawyers. Like we are in sales. We are selling a, the truth or selling a story to a jury or a judge or selling an argument. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to me that so many of these things are, are comparable to everything that we're doing, but we don't want to be seen as salespeople. It, it's the stigma that goes along with it. You know, whenever I deal with professional services folks, I always say, who here thinks that you're in sales? And not, not a lot of people raise their hand. And my follow-up question is, who of us need people to spend money with our companies and buy products from us in order for our businesses to grow and survive? And then, of course, you know, every hand goes up. And I said, that's all sales is. It's a communication pattern presenting what we do to see if we can't solve a problem for a potential client. All right, so let's talk. So, twenty-four hours to improving your business growth and sales. What are we What are we talking about here? The one-day turnaround. So it's it's not a, it's more of awareness. It's talking about why we don't think we're salespeople. Why we hesitate to be good salespeople. You know, and a lot of it is once you become aware that we sell like we buy, and I'll explain that in one second. We recognize why we lose control of of our opportunities. So just national average close rate, according to a HubSpot survey in 2019, 
you know, so what that means is we get yes 40% of the time. If you look at that a little bit differently, that means 60% of the time we're chasing somebody who told us is going to tell us no. But we don't know that because we don't want to be seen as pushy, that the average salesperson. So we allow our clients to control it. And since that's how you and I also buy products, as a salesperson, we accept it. So we call it the buyer-seller dance. And what that means is, Jordan, let's pretend your car lease was up and you knew you had to get a new car. And you drive down to the car lot. One of the sales guys comes down and says, hey, Jordan, thanks for coming in. You know, are you looking to buy a car today? Your natural response is going to be, I'm just looking. Even though you know, I'm just looking. So you're going to mislead the salesperson. The salesperson is going to qualify you going, well, Jordan's here. He's alive. He's breathing. I've got a client. Well, let me tell you about our specials. Let me tell you about this car. Let me tell you what we can do for it. He gives you all of his information. He gives you his quote. You, you now know everything you need to know about that car or maybe a couch you're buying or a TV. It doesn't matter. Now you can take that information and go to the store right down the road and see if you can't get yourself a better deal because that salesperson gave you everything without getting anything in return. And he did that because he doesn't want to seem like he's pushy. He doesn't want to see if he can't corral you. But the process he created is just that. He gave you the quote. Now he's going to call you. When you come back, you're avoiding him. You're waiting for him to give up on calling. He knows if he calls you 19 times, eventually you're going to answer the phone. In reality, it's just a waste of time. What we do with Sandler is we kind of reverse engineer that a little bit. We teach our clients to disqualify a client. And if we can't, then they're qualified. So what that means is if someone comes in to buy a car, a couch, sales training, first I want to know, you know, why they need it. Why do they think they need it? Can I even help you? I'm not even sure if I can. The second is, how, are you just, how is this going to help your business grow? You know, do you have a budget for it? If it does, then we'll go on to the next stage. So before I'll give a fulfillment or a quote, I'm going to know that, yes, I can help you. And if I can't, I'll try to get you in touch with somebody who can help you. B, you're willing and able to participate in a program that's going to take time, energy, and effort and change the way you do business. The next step is you've got the financial resources to afford it and that you're the decision maker. And if you're not the decision maker, who else is involved in making the decision so we can get the job done without losing that control of the process? The reason most salespeople won't do that is just what I said earlier. Because when we buy things, we mislead the salesperson. We tell them we're not interested. We don't tell them how much money we want to spend. We don't do that. We accept that in return from our clients. I teach folks to not accept that from their clients, to have a real honest conversation about does it make sense for us to even engage. And we have a clear beginning and a clear ending to our meeting. So if we were ending a meeting and I would say, Jordan, do you think it makes sense for us to continue the conversation? And if you think it does, let's go ahead and put it on the calendar. And if you don't, no is an okay answer for me. I won't chase you and we'll be good to go. That's kind of what I mean by that. And I'll, I'll give my credit for, you know, walking the walk and not just talking the talk. That's how we ended <laughs> the presentation for us. And that's how we ended up on the podcast. So that was the, uh, you know, the continuation of our conversation was giving, uh, you know, was letting him, was him letting me pick his brain, you know, one more time. Yeah. So it's what it does is it removes the angst of selling. You already know what I expect out of the call. I know what you expect out of the call. And if it makes sense, we move forward. If it doesn't, I'm not chasing you. I'm not calling you. I'm not wasting my time or wasting your time. And it's the clarity that comes to the system. And that's really once you figure that out and you're brave enough to do it because it, it's not comfortable at first. I mean, it's definitely a process. You start realizing you've got better conversations, better experiences, and your pipeline might not be as big, but it's certainly more realistic and you're able to really figure out what your opportunities are. Well, and I think that's something that people lose, well, something that people, something that business owners lose sight of is, you know, if you've got a hundred extra leads in your hopper that are never going to close, then you might be spending, you know, a hundred extra hours chasing all those people down in a situation where, you know, you just wasted the time. That. Jordan, the only thing we can, can control, and that's me, you, anybody in business, is where our time goes. And if our time goes chasing people who give you the think it over, which is a polite no. Matter of fact, 93% of the time people say think it over, it is a no. But the energy that goes into getting that no 
is what could be put into finding new deals, new opportunities, or working the legitimate clients that want to work with us. Makes perfect sense. And so, it, and it's so interesting because by you selling sales training, you are, you know, actually using <laughs> what you're telling on everybody. And then you're going to teach them how to do what you just did to them, to other people, or what you just did for them to right. other people. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing, uh, you know, meta sales pitch. It is, you know, the thing that sets Sandler apart from almost any other national sales company is we're also salespeople. We don't sell it and then somebody else comes in and trains it. I sell it, the guys who work with me sell it, and we all collectively train it. So we do walk the walk. And it's it's interesting because when someone, we talk about an upfront contract, which, you know, is what you and I had when I said, no, it's okay, let's just do this and see if it makes sense. You know, some will say, I don't know if that'll work. And then I'll remind them that's the exact conversation I had with them. You know, the kind of light bulbs go off and it's it starts happening. So. If I don't do it, I won't train it. Um, if I don't, you know, teach it, then it's not in my my wheelhouse. But it, we are walking the walk and living proof of it. So let me go through this a little bit, you know, chronologically. So I, I think the beginning of all this is is having that product and having that service that you believe in. I think that none of this is going to overcome that problem. Am I correct in there? Right. You have to have. So within the theories of sales, if you don't believe in your product or the company you work for you're already off to a bad start because you can't fake sincerity. So you've got to have something you believe in. All right. So we've got that, you know, great business owner that has a, you know, has a great business or working towards it, but truly believes in it. And then, you know, what you're talking about here with that upfront contract, I mean, that starts from the very first interaction, that first phone call, that first client meeting, I mean, whatever it is along there, right? The upfront contract is the very first conversation you and I had. And then we do it again at the end of the meeting so that we have clarity for the next meeting. So an upfront contract will happen a lot throughout the process, gaining consent between both of us. You know, and it's always, you know, an example would be just to pretend this is our first meeting. You know, I'd say, Jordan, you and I had agreed to get together for half an hour. Jordan, you still have that half an hour in your calendar? I do. Excellent. Jordan, you know, Wendy referred us together to have a conversation, and I know we have to get to know each other. So today, Jordan, for me, all I want to do is get to know you, your company a little bit better, have you the opportunity to get to know Sandler and what we do. And at the end of our time, you know, we're going to have a decision to make together. You know, yes means you're not going to sign a contract with me today. It means it makes sense for us to get to know each other more, build out a program. Jordan, the other option is no. And I want you to know you're not going to hurt my feelings. No's are the second best answer I can get. It means I'm not chasing you. You're not avoiding me. We're both you know, responsible adults and that's okay. The third one is let me think it over or maybe that, that's mostly a polite no. And that's when I am gonna chase you and you're gonna avoid me. So if we could just stick with yes or no and whatever makes sense, you and I will do that together. Does that sound like a fair option? How, it, it does. And then just to break character, like how it makes so much sense, but, you know, and obviously I think that's what people are paying for is that how do you internally get to truly believing that no is the second best answer? I mean, like it's, it changes our whole upbringing. Yep. It's very, very, very tough. And it's, there's a lot of psychology around it. And part of that, just our training is not one and done. We do reinforcement training is weekly. So it takes a lot of the trainers and I reinforcing it with the team. And then they're going to hear other people doing it and having success. But you have to realize the aha moments that come with it, that if you still want to chase people that are going to give you a no three months down the road, you can do it. But you'll right. realize that it's a no any way you look at it. So it, 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 it's not easy. I tell everybody when they join us, this is not easy. I'm going to push you into ways that are not comfortable for you. But then suddenly the light bulb will go off and it will be comfortable. I got an email from a client that finally did cold call prospecting and a technique that we teach that is no pressure. She said, I am so pumped. I just did it. I had two great conversations. May not be a deal, but man, the talk we had, we learned about each other. She goes, this is awesome. And then she hung up. And that's where people start getting the clarity. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be demeaning. It can be positive. Yeah. And I, uh, and to echo what you're talking about before, I mean, I, I always think the worst answer is, yeah, no problem. You know, I'll hire you guys next Thursday or whatever it is. And then, <laughs> you know, that call never comes, no return, no call gets returned, you know, no, yep. nothing. But I, I, I understand 
from the client side, I mean, you have the same awkwardness in that moment of nobody wants to say, Hey, I can't afford it. Or I don't think you're worth the money or, you know, whatever the, whatever the no is. Yeah. Well, the difference is you're giving them permission. They don't have to necessarily tell you why they're saying no. I never ask. I said, if the no is okay. And I, people tell me, Mike, nice to meet you. It's interesting. doesn't feel right for me. And you can't get upset with it. It's, Hey, no problem. You know, look forward to, you know, maybe seeing you around town, anything we can ever do to help each other. Now we know. So it's, it's a little bit odd and it's really hard to do it because to look at somebody and say, you can tell me no, and that's all right, which is counterintuitive and not what we were raised to do. But when you see the level of anxiety go down from your potential client that, okay, well, I guess we can just have a conversation. That's where the magic starts happening. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's like a relationship, you know, you have those people that don't want to break up with somebody. So they just ghost them. And then you're like, all right, so this person thinking like you're dead for three weeks, you think that was a better solution than just saying, Hey, look, you know, I don't think we're the right fit. And then you pull the bandaid and it's very much selling is very much like developing a relationship. You know, you start off getting to know each other, being curious, and then you start getting the conversations more directed towards what the outcome is, which is either signing up with the law firm or with me or with a, an electrical company, whatever it is, but they get easier because you already know what I want before we even start talking. And I know um, you guys have the uh, the Sandler submarine, right? That's yep. the uh, the whole process you're going through it. But I want to so, focus on that first. Um, I, I want to say focus on that first conversation a little bit, and then we can go into the, the more detail. Okay. Are there any are, are there any spe- specific things, or what are the most common things that that you need to do in that first chat? you know, other than the upfront contract or in addition to the upfront contract? So the whole process starts with bonding and rapport. I mean, everything starts with bonding and rapport. In traditional sales, it's not really genuine bonding and rapport. We all know that people buy from people they like and who are like them. There's no, there's no secret to that. The secret is how do you make that connection? And the average salesperson will walk into someone's office and see a picture of deep sea fishing and suddenly I'm a deep sea fisherman. Oh, I love deep sea fishing. You know, that's false rapport. And then if you remember the buyer seller dance, the first thing a client does is pretend like we're not even interested in the product. So we're beginning a traditional conversation. I'm pretending I don't need or want your product and you're pretending you like my hobby. You know, we're just off to a bad start. Real bonding and rapport has to do with the elements of communication. You know, the words we say, tonality, body language. It has to do with active listening it has to do with matching and mirroring it has to do with being generally curious about the person and getting them to respond to us so the the average salesperson talks 70 percent of the time the client talks 30. we flip that around i want my client talking at least 70 percent of the time i want to gather the information i want to know if i can help them and that makes a good conversation for them because everybody's favorite topic is ourselves our business but it's genuine. So I'm not faking like I like fishing or motorcycles or anything of that nature. I'm sincere in getting this relationship with you going. And that's what really lowers the first barrier. See, I think that's what I love about the podcast is I always, I always try to speak as little as possible and listen as much as I can. And it's, it's easier. I mean, like, I don't, I don't have to prepare for this. You're the expert. I'm just curious as to what the next follow-up question is based upon what you're talking about. It, that's the same thing with the Sandler sales process. It is easier because the client's doing not most of the work, but most of the sharing. So the more information I can gather, the better I can help you or your client because I understand, or I can say, I'm not the right guy for you. And I've done that. I've had folks come and what they really need is marketing help. And I'll tell them, I said, I honestly can't help you as much as you've heard great things about, you know, Sandler. Let me introduce you to some people I know in marketing. And then maybe we can reconnect down the road. You know, that's rare that people would do that. So do we have enough time to go through that submarine pretty quickly or? Yep. So, okay. so a lot of companies talk about having a common language. We hear that a lot in, in businesses and sales organizations. But the reality is if you dig into what the um, common language is, it's not there. The submarine is the common language we can put in. And what that means is of the steps, which is bonding and rapport, and then it goes into the upfront contract, then it goes into pain, then it goes into budget, then it goes decision, fulfillment, and post-sale. That's the common language. So if I'm debriefing a meeting I had with someone, 
I could sit down and say, did I do a good job with pain? Pain is simply what is Jordan's issue with his company and can I help him overcome it? If the answer to that is yes, we move on to the next step. If the answer is no, then we don't. But it's a, def it's a defined step. So I can sit down and say, I didn't do a good job of uncovering pain. I could do better. So then I go back backwards to the upfront contract. I didn't set up a good enough upfront contract with Jordan because I didn't tell him I was going to ask him some tough questions. So the common language allows you to debrief yourself as a sales manager with this team. Average sales manager says, hey, Jordan, how's it going with the ABC company? Going great. They've got it into the, the, the boss. They're going to come back with an answer. That, that doesn't really mean anything. A sales manager who goes through our program would say, hey, Jordan, what stage in the submarine are you with ABC deal? Well, I'm in budget. Great. Tell me about budget because it means something. They have to say, well, they've got, the, you know, during the pain step, we uncovered $800,000 worth of money that they're losing. They've got a budget of about 40000 which means that we can put together a program for them. And that's where we're getting to the next step, which is decision. So each step of the submarine has defined actions, techniques, and outcomes supported by the upfront contract. And bond and rapport is obviously laced all the way through it. So it's really, that's the process. And each of those happen in a sequence for a reason. So a traditional salesperson will give a quote right after they meet you. And then that's why you never get your client on the phone again. You don't get a, a fulfillment stage or a quote from me until stage six, after I know who you are, can I help you? Do you have a pain I can solve? Do you have the, the money in order to invest? Are you willing to invest that plus the energy and resource to learn the program other than yourself who's in the decision making process? Let's have the fulfillment stage. That's kind of the way the submarine works. So I want to I want to go into a little bit more detail there. Yeah. So, you know, it's again, it's interesting because you are taking people through the process and then tr teaching them to take other people through the process. So when you're hearing pain points, I mean, obviously you're talking mostly to business owners or sales managers at larger businesses or whatever it is along those lines. What do you see to be the most common pain points that you are able to help? So the most common are proposals that don't go anywhere because we keep getting think it overs and they sit in our, our pipeline forever, or they go to the competition to validate a competition's deal or to use that to get a cheaper deal. Um, just taking too long to close deals because we keep getting, let me think it over, call me back next week. That meeting gets canceled, you know, discounting too much. I mean, there's always going to be some level of that, but salespeople generally, when they get pushed back on price, go right to discounting. Well, this is not my best price. Let me see what we can do. So conceding to the client without ever getting anything in return. So once you turn that around and you start having real conversations, that's where the power comes to understanding what that's going to be. I mean, there's always other aspects of it, but those are typically the sales pain points. You know, so if a client says to me, I'm just, I'm discounting way too much to get a deal. That's one pain point. Or it's taking me forever to get a proposal into a decision step. That's two pain points. And there could be three. So I would go back and say, Jordan, you mentioned you're discounting too much. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And then they're going to share. And then there's a, a sequence we go down of about eight questions that will help understand what that really means. And at the end of it, you know, I'm okay with 5% discounting, but my team seems to be hovering around 15. And that's costing me $10,000 a deal. And I do 10 deals a month. So I got a hundred thousand dollar problem. I'm not happy about now we're monetizing what his problem is. You said deal. And I said, you know, you also mentioned that your deals are taking too long to close. You know, tell me some more about that same process. And we figure out what that is. So in theory, in that role play, that client had a hundred thousand dollar discount problem that he didn't like over a year. That's 1.1 million. I certainly can put together a program for him for a whole lot less than that. But our process takes a, you're still going to have that element, but you're more in control of it. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting to me because um, I was reading this thing and I'm like, I'm fascinated by McDonald's, not <laughs> from the standpoint of like actually eating their food, from the standpoint of how they run their business. Because at its core, McDonald's really just has a process. Like you're not going to McDonald's for a great hamburger, you're going because <laughs> you know you'll get a similar hamburger everywhere and you'll get it quick and you'll get it cheap. 
And so when you look at like a Big Mac, you know, they know what the bun costs, what the cheese costs, what the lettuce, what all those things are and how to work the price around there. If it's going to be a loss leader or whatnot, when you talk about a professional service, it's so much harder to do that because you don't have, it's not so clear on the individual stuff. And then even on mid-sized companies that sell products, if you buy a million widgets from them, they can now go back and get a better rate on, on widgets. So it's just, it's so funny to talk about price from the standpoint of nobody really knows what anything actually costs. Yeah, and I know we always think price is the problem, but really price rare, rarely is the problem. It's because we're not controlling the process that we let price become the issue. But if you're really understanding you know, what the problem is and the understanding I can convince you that my solution is gonna fix that problem, then price becomes secondary. You know, we use the word pain because when people start realizing that their $100,000 problem really is a $1.1 million problem because it's not just one month, it's month over month over month, and maybe it's been going on for two years, business owners very rarely look under the hood that deeply because they don't want to know. You know, they don't want to get to that level. Our process brings it to the forefront and we can help or we can't. So is that, so correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So you're saying price usually isn't the problem. Is that from the standpoint of because you're explaining to them the value, you're explaining to them the full cost of not going with you? Uh, yep. So, and it's really shouldn't be a problem in any process. It's the, because we give price up so quickly, the client has no idea what their service would be in traditional sales. And our sales, once a business owner realizes that, his $1,000 deal issue is really times 10 because he's doing 10 times a, a, a month, times 12 months, times the last two years. That's a lot of money. And you'll see them realizing this as the conversation. Now, the flip side is true, too. If a business owner tells me I do 10 deals a month, I'm fine with 5% discounting. You know, we hover around six. My response would be, how do you feel like I can help you? Because it sounds like you're right where you need to be. And sometimes, like, I, I don't know if you can or not. I just wanted to learn more. Fair enough. Now we know, probably can't help you, but let's talk about it. Maybe just something you want to know more about or interest, and you got to be okay with that. But I'll leave that meeting knowing that I'm not calling that particular person back because we parted friends. And if he, if I interested him enough, he'll call me and maybe we'll do something, maybe we won't. But price is only the issue when they don't understand how you're going to help them solve that problem. But once they see that, you know, it's different. It's, just to jump back, if you go to the doctor with, um, with um, kidney stones, are you going to ask them what it costs to get that kidney stone fixed? Or are you going to say, just fix the kidney stone? It hurts like hell. It's the same thing in business. If the real pain is there, and I know if I can fix it for a reasonable budget, and the upside is there, I'm doing it. You know? Yeah, I think your uh, your colleague, I think, used the uh, aspirin analogy when we wrote yeah. that made so much sense. The you know, I may not buy 100 aspirin at Costco for, for $3, but if I'm about to go into a meeting with a splitting headache, I might spend 100 bucks on the one pill. Yeah, because it's immediate, and it's, it's right there in front of you. So it's a discovery process. And, you know, I owned another – before I owned this, I owned a, another business, and I can reflect on that company, and I can see how things could have been differently if I knew about this particular process, but also how much I lied to myself about how much trouble I was in in 08, 09, you know, I, it, I owned a cabinetry company in 2008, 2009. Not a great place to be when, you know, the world shut down. But I creatively hid my biggest problems because I didn't want to admit it. I didn't want to look at it. I wanted to try to survive. That's not, lots of business owners are like that. But once the light shined on it, they either had to deal with it or not, but at least they know. So I think that, I think that's a perfect segue into the next thing. So we're talking about, you know, these, these 24 hours, this, this thing to be aware of. What can business owners be doing right now? I mean, obviously, reach out to you. Put that on the list. Yeah. So there's different programs we have, depending upon what they want to do. So the, if they want to really – so I'm going to segue into an, another program we have called Leadership for Organizational Excellence. That's for business owners that the business has taken control of them. So a lot of people never had the opportunity to learn how to run a business. I'm very passionate about – X. Next thing I know, I've got four trucks out there, you know, doing, doing what I want. I'm building pools, plumbing, electrician, selling pest control, whatever it is. But I didn't grow my company intentionally. I don't know how to get out of it. I don't have an exit plan. 
I don't have an organizational chart. Um, we met with somebody yesterday who created a sales manager out of his best salesperson without a job description, without performance metrics. And now, of course, he's thinking this person may not be the right one. How do I get out of it? So that program is intentional and makes everybody work and think about planning, positions, people, processes, performance, and then getting to the passion of running the business, getting organized. In that process, they're going to discover if they've got the right salespeople, the right operations, the right organizational chart, you know, the people I started my company with 10 years ago, are they really the ones that are going to get me to 10 million? They got me to 2 million. Do they have the skill set? It's not easy and it's a hard look at the business, but you now know what you have to do to grow it and how to get out of it. Because if it's all about, you know, if Jordan family law was just about you, you would have a hard time 10, 15, 20 years from now trying to sell it. But you know, you're building an organization that's not necessarily dependent upon just you. You've got other avenues there, other attorneys. Yeah, I find sports to be the best analogy with creating a business because I think it's that one that we see. Well, I mean, at least I like sports for one. But two, <laughs> like you see the, you know, the trading of players, the signing free agents, you know, the changing of the team. And, you know, you don't you don't get to peek into Google and see how they're making those switches, but you can look and see who the yeah. Orlando Magic are trading or, you know, whatever it is along those lines. Constantly and so it, building. Right. And it just it's so interesting to to look at a business from the perspective of being like the general manager of a sports team when you're the CEO of a business. Yep. So for that program, and there's a 13 blind spot survey, anybody's welcome to reach out to me. I'll give it to them for free. It'll help them really crystallize if their business is in good shape. Um, what normally comes out of it is they've got a lot of work to do. And my questions are, do you have an exit plan? 99% of the time it's what's an exit plan or no. My favorite one is how many family members do you have in key roles? That's when I usually get the head go down or yeah, because it was made sense when they started at home, you know, and do you have an org chart? It's usually that lets them know they've got some work to do if they want to get to a point of selling the company, get it going on vacation without the phone ringing the whole time, you know, not feeling like they're involved in every single decision from that process we will talk about sales. You know, do you have a repeatable, manageable process? And that doesn't mean a lot to people, but you know, I'll say your accounting department, do they have a process of paying bills? Well, yeah, you know, the invoices come in, it gets put into when it has to be done. We assign it to this person, they sign off on it, I approve it. Great, so what's your sales process? And no one thinks of it. They just hire people and put them out there. So my advice always in this first 24 hours is, are you willing to take a real honest look at where you're at and where you want to go. And if you don't have those answers, that's okay too. We can help you out with that. But if you are, are you okay with what's going to come out of it? <laughs> so, you know, we've had people get, you know, one client completely transformed her landscaping company. And it was a lot of fun to work with her because she got into it. And she went from, I just want to sell this thing in five years to, I don't think I'll ever sell it. This is good. I got it structured. I got it organized. People are listening to me. <laughs> Things are happening. So it's, it can happen, but no one teaches you how to run a business. You figured out the school of hard knocks or maybe your father or your grandfather, but we're not that world anymore. We got to look at things differently. Well, and that's why I just, I love, you know, somebody with your experience. So you've run a business before and you get to see all the positives and negatives. And now, you know, you transition to another business. You can see where those mistakes are to really understand people. I mean, that's, I also run a, a marketing company for lawyers and so like, I'm like, oh, this is what we did in the law firm. This is what worked. This was a waste of money. This is what we didn't do. You know, it's just, it's, it's crazy to have that perspective and how helpful it is because you start seeing yourself in other people. Oh yeah. I mean, and I get to work really privileged to be able to work with such a wide group of businesses, but it's really strip away the varnish. All the problems are almost always the same. And so it doesn't matter if you're an electrician, a painter, a plumber, pest control attorneys, it's all down to organizing your company for success. And those principles are pretty much universal. And it's, it's, it's tough sometimes because, you know, one client, he said I, he was just in angst because he knew he had to get rid of close personal friends because the business had outgrown them. And he felt so much better after he did it. Cause the fact of the matter is they were taking advantage of them. They weren't doing their job. You know, it's just very comfortable. 
He's doing so great right now. It's, it's, and it's not because of me, by the way. I provide objectivity. I provide tools so that they discover for themselves. They do the hard work and they come out of it in good shape. Yeah, it's, it's one of those. I think all of us want to make more money with less aggravation. And less Absolutely. aggravation, may be, it may be less work or it may be doing the stuff that you enjoy or maybe not having to cut through so much red tape or maybe having assistance with the stuff you really hate. I mean, I think that's really kind of what everybody wants. Well, that's right. But you have to sit back and you have to be willing to, again, I keep saying it, you got to be honest with yourself. You know, so in my first company, retrospect, I should have closed it down two years before I did, but ego got in my way and I was convinced I could outperform everybody telling me that I couldn't, you know, and I almost did it. But the biggest mistake I made was I put all my eggs in one basket. So when that manufacturer closed down, I lost everything. And, you know, I don't know if I would have made it if they hadn't, but the lies I was telling myself, you know, shielding myself from not wanting to just admit I'd run my course with this particular company didn't only cost me personally, but, you know, my staff, I had a, you know, with not a whole lot of notice, I just say we're closing down. And unfortunately, in the world's worst economy, you know, you got to go look for a job. So honesty and clarity count, you know, and if you go through the process, you don't have to accept it, but you're not going to be able to hide it anymore because it's pretty pointed. So, I mean, you're just a wealth of knowledge here, and we've got about, you know, seven to ten more minutes. So is there anything else you want to make sure we cover? Any other good piece of wisdom you want to provide to our watchers and listeners? What What's the best use of the next, you know, ten minutes or so? Yep. So I think what I would say right now, more than ever, is take that look at your company. Do you want to come out of this whole shutdown, rebuilding of the environment, you know, coming out of COVID. Now's the time to realize you have the right people, the right positions. You know, do you want to do things differently? Did COVID provide you more opportunities than you had before? That could happen if you're looking at it correctly. You know, we never had a virtual program. When COVID came, we now have a virtual program as well as in-class training. Matter of fact, we've got 15 people in the other room going through our foundations program right now. We have seven of them dial in virtually that we would have never had those seven because we just, we didn't look at it correctly. You know, do you need that commercial office space? You know, is now's the time to make those changes coming into 2021 as painful as they are. You just can't put it off. You know, are there other avenues of revenue that are out there that you can go get, you know, or, or branch into, you know, so you run a successful law firm, and a marketing firm that supports the legal industry. That's, that's a great channel. What, what else can other people do to support that? So it's downtime is okay, but you got to take that hard look and say, I don't know if having these people in the right role, they're not going to take the hill with me. You know, you got to be tough. And so for people nodding their head for the last, you know, two minutes <laughs> as you've been given this, that, that was the, the questionnaire that you have? The questionnaire is the 13 or it's not 13, it's the blind spot survey. So it covers about 14 areas from always be recruiting, you know, is your company's mission ingrained in your culture of your, of your business? Does everybody know what it is? Is the individual goals set to the corporate goals? You know, do you even have goals? So it's, if you're in a partnership, my recommendation is don't take it together, take it separately because you're scoring yourself on one to 10 and you're giving yourself an in-game score. And when I work with partners, I rarely get past question five because they'll look at each other and go, no, it's not. We're doing a good eight on this. It's like an eight. What are you talking about an eight? And I'm like, okay, maybe we should take a pause and go over it. Individuals will look at it. And I've had them say, I'm not happy with this. I'm like, that's the wrong way to look at it. You should be happy because now you know. Now we get to work on or you can work on it. You don't want to engage with me on what that is. So, you know, I'll give my email address and anybody who wants it. I'll be happy to email it. It's uh, Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L dot Aldridge, A-L-D-R-I-C-H at Sandler.com. And that process alone, if you're honest, will pretty much tell you where you're at and where you could use some help or where you might want to shine the light a little bit deeper. I'm happy to debrief that with them as well. That's part of what I do. And that doesn't mean they need to do business with me. No's okay. This is more of a, the experience. Yeah, there's a, um, 
there's a company lawyer. Okay. And um, we just put that in the comments. So people have it right there. Um, so there's a company that does a, uh, the small firm scorecard. So it seems to be a little similar to what you're talking about, but for law firms. And it's, it's always interesting to me. Cause it's like, even if you get an F on it, you're better off getting an F having done it than you are having an F and not having done it to know what you have to look, you know, to work towards. Said perfectly, Jordan said perfectly. It's now a lot of business owners are smart, passionate people, but they feel lost because how do I get this organized? What, you know, how do I even create a job description that's specific to the role I need? You know, and these are all tools we have to help with that. And of course, on the sales side, you know, if they're suffering from the same thing, most companies are, it's because they're living in the buyer system. They're accepting think it overs. They're quoting before they even validate if this person can do business with us. They don't believe in their pipeline because it's, it's big. Maybe it looks great, but they're only getting 35 to 40 percent of it. You know, so all of that is frustrating for business owners. And that's where, you know, it's, it's dynamic when you see that change and you see what happens. So it's, you know, that's so there's really two separate programs, but. The organizational excellence one has really helped a lot of companies just get some clarity and a plan. The sales, you know, five, five, maybe six of our clients last year won President's Award for the companies that had that award. And they stood up and said, hey, I wouldn't have done it, you know, if I didn't understand what the value was of having a sales system. I don't take credit. They do all the work. My job is to teach them the techniques, role play, reinforce, hold them accountable, which we do. But they've got to have, you know, the guts to go out there and do something different that differentiates them from everybody else selling their product. Makes perfect sense. All right. <laughs> so then let me uh, let me pick, pick your brain one last time. Something sort of related, sort of different. So we try to end these all kind of the same way. Um, if somebody's watched this for the last uh, 40 something minutes and takes nothing away from this except this one last key thing, the one most important takeaway, the biggest piece of advice that you want to give to as many business owners as possible, what is it? Whoa, good question, Jordan. Thank so you. From so that's the, why we save it for the last one, right? Yeah, yeah. So from the sales part, when I talked about the upfront contract and kind of did a little role play with you, it's the single best thing I could tell any salesperson to do. Set the expectation, set what you want, understand what your client wants, and end the meeting with a definitive next step. Don't take a think it over don't take a smoke screen because all it is is going to suck up all your time and inflate your pipeline. On the business side, my honest answer is close your eyes and think hard. You already know what the issues are. You're just avoiding them because we don't want to deal with them. Take the survey. Happy to review it with you or you can do it yourself. But the things that you're hesitating to do the most, it may be getting rid of a family member or an employee has been with you for a long time that is no longer effective or, or able to get you where you want to go. They always know it. All I do is bring objectivity and, and don't let them deny it any longer. But it's honest and clarity. Those two things should be a mantra. There we go. Thank you so Hopefully much for joining us today. Nope, Jordan, thank you for the invite. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. And um, so we have your email address down here. We have the website. Can you just give us the phone number one more time so people don't have to scroll back? Yep, it's area code 407. Three four two, one two three five. That is my personal cell phone, so it'll come right to me. All right. Thank you again, Jordan. Thank you. This is fantastic.